Hello and welcome to this episode of Pictures on My Mind. I am your host Edward Thompson and today I'll be talking about the original surrealist street photographer and that is the photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson. Now he's obviously known quite widely for the kind of the decisive moment and lots of other stuff but what you might not know is how much surrealism had a part to play in his early street photography. We'll be looking at a book called Henri Cartier-Bresson Early Work and that was uh, published as part of a, a, an accompanying exhibition that toured America in the mid-1980s and it has a really cool essay in it so I want to read some extracts from that but also show you some of the most kind of well what I'd say the most surreal um, street photographs that he took in those fledgling years when he was just getting into photography. Henri Cartier-Bresson was a massive influence on photography and arguably the most influential photographer of the 20th century. He went on to inspire thousands and thousands of photographers and it wasn't just through his amazing photography but his philosophy because he was very uh, outspoken. He spoke a lot about you know, the, the philosophy of his photography and that kind of ties into his development as a young photographer being kind of in the orbit of the surrealists. So the idea of having a manifesto, obviously that was something planted in his kind of uh, in his mind as a, as a young man. So it's really interesting to see kind of that coming through into kind of his philosophical nature. And yeah, went on to inspire lots of great photographers, including Tony Ray Jones, who I spoke about in a previous video. And a bit like um, Tony Ray Jones, Henri Cartier-Bresson was also a great photographer, but also really just really good. He's a really good person, you know? And you can see that through his actions, not just in his photography, but through his life. In World War II um, and the build up to it, he was working kind of for sort of socialist newspapers in Paris. And then, yeah, he joined the army and he joined the French army, not particularly a high rank. I can't remember what exactly the rank was, but it wasn't very high up. And that meant when he was caught by the Nazis in the Black Forest and sent to a prisoner of war camp, he wasn't given like, well, any, any preferential treatment. He was working under forced labor for three years. And in, in three of those years, he spent a lot of time in solitary confinement because he kept trying to escape. That's right, he tried to escape a Nazi prisoner of war camp in the Black Forest. And on the third attempt, he was successful. And he somehow managed to wake, make his way all the way back to Paris and join the French resistance. That's pretty incredible, right? <laughs> Isn't that, that's, that's amazing. So you've got this guy, he's not this brilliant, like, um, photojournalist and, and street photographer, but like, you know, he's fighting the Nazis. Like, it's, it's absolutely crazy, isn't it? And the thing as well, right? He was a progressive in a time of fascism. In 1937, he married a Japanese dancer that was called El Mahini, but her real name was Ratna Mahini, and they had this amazing marriage that spanned 30 years. This is a photograph of her two years before they got married, and she was a very accomplished dancer in her own right. You know, they say, you know, the famous um, Ratna Mahini. If you Google it, you'll, you'll see lots of stuff about her. This is a photograph taken the year they got married in 1937, and how cool do they look? Like, you know what? They look like hipsters before hipsters even existed, right? Check out his hair, what she's wearing, what he's wearing, just the, the cool pose. It's almost like a James, like James Dean-esque image. It's absolutely amazing. Here's a photograph taken of them by Irving Penn, like the famous Irving Penn. He's in this amazing cool portrait. And there's Elle and she's kind of like dancing and doing a cool, cool pose. And there's Bresson just sort of deadpan, but he's kind of, his, his camera's being held and sort of swinging. There's something quite funny and cheeky about that. It seems kind of a funny portrait, you know, and they obviously knew that. And then this is a photograph now years later, and uh, it's just, it's a very silly photo. And there's Bresson kind of looking at slides and it's all a bit, a bit jaunty and a bit funny. And I just thought it was really funny looking through some of these old photos of Marie Cartier Bresson and, uh, and Elle. Like how much fun they look like they're having, do you know what I mean? And it's not serious, it's silly, it's fun. It's like a love for life. And it's sort of far apart from this sort of mental image we have now of the photographer all dressed in black and serious and moody and aloof, you know? He was arguably like the most famous photographer in the world during, during this period. And he's, you know, he's just having a good time. He's having fun. And, and I think that's the thing is that ultimately because of experience in World War II and fascism, he was a humanist photographer, okay? And at that point, that humanist movement in photography, you think about lots of the other early Magnum photographers, they were really behind that as well, you know? They'd been through World War II, they'd seen fascism, they'd seen the horror of war, and they came through it kind of wanting something else, you know, wanting something good. Um, a love of people. And then somehow, you know, that wanes and then you get the 70s and 80s and to a lot of the photographers by that point in the 80s, this idea of a humanist photographer, well, what's that about, you know? It's the 80s, it's Thatcher, it's Reagan, it's money, okay? The photography needs to be flashy and colorful. It needs to be making money and advertising. It's this whole different kind of motivation. And Henri Cartier-Bresson actually said something about that in a quote, and I've got that quote here in a book. And the book is The Mind's Eye, and uh, yeah, let me just open this up. So yeah, here it is written in French and the translation. 
In a world that is buckling under the weight of profit making, that is overrun by the destructive sirens of techno science and the power hunger of globalization, the new brand of slavery, beyond all that, friendship exists, love exists. You know, it's poetic, it's beautiful. You know, it's not about the money, it's something else. And of course, yeah, you know, if you look into Cartier-Bresson, like, you know, his family owned factories and stuff, right? I think textile factories, like he had a bit of money. So of course, you know, he's afforded that luxury, but you know, he could have just been like, stuff it. I'm just gonna, you know, go the other way, whatever. But no, I think his experience in um, World War II, and I think his experience in his life, his love of L and everything drove him to this more, you know, ultimately progressive way of thinking. And I think that's amazing. So it's re Henri Cartier-Bresson, this book, Early Work, it was by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and it was part of a touring exhibition of his work that went all over America. Um, so here we go. This is a funny cheeky shot of him and his feet, obviously a self-portrait. Um, yeah, first published in 1987, the Museum of Modern Art, and the exhibition toured New York, Detroit, Chicago, San Diego, Massachusetts, Houston, and Ottawa in Canada. And yeah, there's some really cool essay at the start. So you know what, if you'll indulge me, I will read some of it to you. And I'll put some pictures over to make it more interesting. Cartier-Bresson's work in the early 30s, his earliest photographic work is another matter. Trained as a painter, Cartier-Bresson formed the artistic outlook under the rising star of surrealism and with a culture whose aspirations and pressures were very different from those that emerged after the war. Cartier-Bresson was also influenced by surrealism. I used to go to a cafe Place Blanche, but I was too young to speak, but I was sitting at the cafe with all the surrealists. I knew Dalin. He was a good painter in those days. In my early paintings, I was impressed by the attitudes of a surrealist. The role of subconscious and the revolt against the bourgeois conceptions. His early photographs have virtually nothing to do with photojournalism. Indeed, they are insistently and quite inventively subvert the narrative expectations upon which photojournalism depends. Stylistically, too, the early work is different from the work after the war blunter, less lyrical, and much more severely focused on a narrow range of subjects. And that was the thing, you know. I think most photographers, check this out. Every photojournalist was a street photographer. I bet you money on that, because it's the sandbox level, it's the training ground, okay? But then not all street photographers become photojournalists. And Henri Cartier-Bresson is very much the former. He was someone who really got into street photography. He's honing his skills, he's getting these amazing images. He has his experiences in World War II, and suddenly he sees photography as a way of telling stories. And I think the problem is with street photography, as cool as it is, as amazing as the pictures look, it's always surface. It's always, there's never any real context to it. I think Bresson thought, wait, I can tell real stories. And that's when he started building up these larger projects about different people's way of lives. And sometimes that can be quite political, you know? If there's someone in the world who's told is like the enemy by a group of people, and you go and photograph them and show them in a very humane way, that's kind of a political act. It doesn't seem like it, but the photograph of, of everyday life can be hugely political. And on a side note, that's one thing I learned very much from one of my one-time mentors, the Russian photographer, Sergei Chilikov. But I think that's, that's another video. So yeah, there's another bit in the book now. And again, it's about sort of his encounter with surrealism. So I thought we'd just quickly read that out. Cartier-Bresson recalls that he had been attracted to surrealism around 1925, only about a year after the movement was inaugurated. And yeah, at that point, like he was a teenager. He's really young. He was born in 1908. Cartier-Bresson explained, I was marked not by surrealist painting, but by the conceptions of Breton, which satisfied me a great deal, the role of spontaneous expression. And there's a French word here, which I'm probably going to massacre, but jealousement, jealousement, and of intuition, and above all, the attitude of revolt. It was, he added, a revolt in art, but also in life. This is both an, both an apt definition of surrealism and a key to its influence on young Cartier-Bresson. Yeah. So there you go. So, you know, he's a young kind of a young man. He's sort of on the fringe of these kind of surrealist movements. It's very much, you know, in the mindset. He is a painter at that point, very interested in painting. And I think, yeah, the book, um, the book shows some of these paintings here, which obviously, you know, you can see almost very much in that kind of tradition of the surrealist sort of painting at that time. 
1928. Um, yeah. This is a really cool portrait, isn't it? So yeah, there's some amazing photos of him and he kind of he almost looks like a very severe kind of artist kind of portrait you'd see at the time. Uh, a shot of him here with a painter, an exhibition in Mexico City in 1935. And then, yeah, here we go. So 1935 here with, uh, with a Leica. And yeah, the book goes into some detail. It's really cool. It compares lots of photographers at the time. So photographers like Andre Cortez here and uh, Charles J. Van Schiak, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So yeah, um, sort of big influences and things that were kind of around that time. And it can be difficult looking back at lots of older photographers' work because you know, you're not really quite seeing kind of what was going on in their kind of sort of media and culture and zeitgeist, if you will, at that point, not what would have had a really big influence. So there we go. Yeah, really cool book for the essay. Um, who is who have we got here? Galassi. Let's give him. He just put his first name. Peter Galassi was the guy who put this book out. And yeah, the essay is quite substantial. Lots of notes, lots of stuff. Right. So let's get into it. So this first shot here, it's almost like an abstract. It's quite bizarre. Again, it's quite surreal. It's one of those ideas the surrealists had of like taking an object. We're almost getting into the realm of the kind of ready-made here, sort of taking something out of context and sort of looking at it in a new light. And in a way with a photograph, you can do that. You can photograph something that seems quite mundane and just through the act of photographing it, you change it, you change how it's witnessed. But yeah, this is not the Bresson that we know and love. This is something else, but this is 1931. He was born in 1908. How old is he here? Is he 21? Anyway, I'll, I'll work through the maths. It's always hard, these on the spot maps, isn't it? So yeah, so he's a young, he's a young photographer. But then, you know, mannequins, mannequins, inherently surreal. Mannequins, more mannequins, more kind of weird associations. So, you know, starting to draw elements together here, the suit, the suit, the mannequin, the people cuddling, the face. Again, super surreal. So we've got, you know, piles of weird, they outlines of hands. I don't even know what this is. Um, is it, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's post-World War One. I. I don't know if there's something related to, related to something medical. Again, this strange distortion here, but again, very posed. It's not like the kind of Cartier-Bresson photo you expect, where it's just an observer of life, just floating around. It's quite performative. Some photographs here, they're okay. Nothing too surreal for me at this point. Okay, looking out of a window. But yeah, there's a, there's a hot point. There's a point where it starts to cap. And so yeah, so we've got, it's terrible here, but you know, we've got a bit of the comedy here, of like the, the two dogs are going at it and the dogs are looking on. It's that kind of, you know, photo joke. We've seen some photographers do a lot from the eighties onwards. So even Cartier-Bresson was playing around with that kind of silliness. And it's funny, it's funny, it's funny. And, and it kind of, no one's the butt of the joke there, apart from the dog. Right, um, again, there's this guy here. Um, it's obviously very short and the guy's kind of kneeling down to kind of mimic that. Again, it's a bit playful, but again, it's a little bit posed. There's a little bit of a playfulness going on there. Um, here we go. So obviously he's a painter and he's an artist. And both these images, I mean, this is obviously a paint, a, you know, a photograph of an artist, but this one here incorporating the sort of crude line drawing in the background and the guy kind of leaning on his face. This is probably one of the first instances I've seen in the book of mirroring. And this is a common like street photography trick. But again, it's also calling back to his interest in art. It's, a, it's sort of a weird, almost not Picasso, but you know, it's like a crude kind of little cubist sort of sketch of a, of a face. And he's been drawn to that. It's 1933. Um, just some cheeky chappy in bed. What's that on him? I oh, know it's just a blanket. There's nothing too weird or wacky about that. There's nothing too weird or wacky about this. Okay, so the angles have changed a bit now. These are quite sort of almost not top angle, but quite high angles. And that's starting to kind of change the way you look at the photograph. It's starting to be a little bit more odd. I mean, this shot, not so much this one, but this one, this sort of the light, the highlights reflecting off the train tracks, the two men leaning over, uh, the weird V composition. There's something a little bit almost constructed here. It's starting to think about lines of composition, but it's not your usual kind of thing. It's something else. Now we get weird. Here we go. So it's 1932 and it looks like a dragged fur coat of hair, just a massive mulch. So like a throwback to that first image in the book of like just the object, which is like a vest, but this is something else now. 
this is something kind of weird and sort of surreal and horrific. On the next page, what's that? Just a giant statue, like a bust. It could be the kind of bust you see on a ship, whatever that's called, but one of those. But the way it's wrapped up and bound down again, a little bit weird, a little bit surreal. Here we go. Now we're getting there. So now we're in 1932-33 and this shot, person's having a cigarette and Breston's framed it so that all these weird, ghoulish, kind of almost trollish like faces are kind of bearing down on that smoke. But the smoke has got their eyes shut. It's like they're oblivious. It's like they're not aware. It's starting to tell a weird story and it's also quite, it is quite a surreal image. And it's that usual common thing where as a photographer, you can compact any elements in that 3D view that you're looking at into two dimensions. Again, this shot here, it's a little, a little um, figure of a boy, some kind of sculpture or brass. But again, the sheer amount of text in the background is really weird and the angle almost makes the boy look a bit like a giant because from that perspective, he's almost the size of a house. So again, sort of playing with that, playing with that a bit. I mean, I'm sure this is just a normal image that you kind of see at that era walking around in 1932, but damn, it looks a bit spooky, doesn't it? It's like some Phantom of the Opera shit going on. And then this kind of infinite, infinite line into the mist in the background with those trees drawing your eyes into his head. The bowler hat, I'm thinking of Magritte, which obviously is that later on. But yeah, I think it is. So again, there's some, some weird signifiers for surrealism I'm seeing now, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a strange shot. And it's that classic thing of when there's a wet floor, um, the reflections look really cool. So the, the wet floor is reflecting the light from the clouds and it's giving us a really, really lovely kind of glow around the subject. Yeah, we are, we are firmly into the surreal territory now. I'm really feeling it. So again, I feel this is a little bit posed, this one, but it still feels kind of bizarre. Just again, there's sort of infinite lines into the background, the way she sat here. And then this one's something else. So when's this one? 1933 Trieste. And it's yeah, the person laying down black and white, black and white, black and white of the, where is it? Is it a smokestack? I don't know, it's something there. It could be a lighthouse and um, there's some people in the background, but yeah, it's sort of, it's quite minimal because um, there's not a huge amount going on compared to some of his later photos, but it just looks, it looks like a painting, doesn't it? It looks like one of those kind of surrealist paintings. Um, I have to flash the one up I'm thinking of. Again, here we go. So 1932, um, the curtain knot is hanging down in front of the face of the man looking at the paper. And like, this is like surrealist street photographer 101, isn't it? This kind of photograph, you know? Seeing an element, seeing another element in the frame and trying to put them together. Um, common things you see are people kind of lining up certain things or posts or, or whatever, something in the background. But you know, this is fun because it almost looks like he's wearing a turban. It's kind of a wild mask. Again, the next page, it's a court moment, someone's jumping. It's not as effective, I'd say, but the way the, the, the coat has been caught flapping in the air, it almost looks like wings. So again, it's these strange, weird, I mean, happy accidents, essentially. But, you know, some of them you can plan for and some of them just happen. And in this little double page spread, there's both. So he's experimenting with just being open to the moment and he's also thinking about how he can put stuff together. So it's not all just dumb luck. Some of it's calculated as well. Ah, oh, just great, just great. Look at these guys. So we've got like these two almost quite similar compositions. I know one's kind of straight on, one's from above, but just these sort of minimal, minimal stick figure characters. Yeah, these minimal stick figure characters and they're just kind of, just sort of lost here almost. And the use of shadow to almost construct these shapes and geometric shapes going on and right into the distance. Wow, you can see the kind of land like falling away. And up here again, sort of weird lines, weird geometric shapes, the silhouette, the wheel, sort of like minimal compositions in a way, because there's not much going on, but just, you know, accurate and succinct. And these very much echo, I think, the photograph he takes, which you might see later on of the kind of person cycling past a spiral staircase. Obviously, he's lined up a composition which he's liked in both shots, and he's just waited. So in this one, he's waited for this man to clear the bottom of the frame. And he's waited for this person here to maybe walk past and stop or look back again he set his like spot like here is a good composition i'm going to wait here and then he gets it as something happens almost walking into that stage set he's kind of constructed as a composition just waiting for someone to walk in yeah it's cool great so again um similar things here we've got these murals on the background this weird mural here and the woman walking past again, probably waited, waited for someone to walk past and bang. He was very quick though. He could have just seen it coming and quickly done a quick snap. 
Same with this one. We've got these murals in the background here and the guy walking by, and the nice thing is he's caught him mid-step. Any street photographer will tell you it's really easy to photograph someone walking and make them look really ridiculous, like just really awkward. Whereas getting a, getting someone in mid-stride, it just looks nice, doesn't it? So it's another little street photography game for you to play, to try and photograph people when they're walking and actually make them look kind of cool. But there we go, and framed him behind the circle again. And you know, there's this nice mirroring in that, had he shot a bit wide, we've got these two people in, but there's these glimpses of people. Look, there's more mirroring and repetition. Each person has been framed behind, with a circle behind them. So again, lovely. There's a sort of consistency here. I don't know what that writing says or what that denotes to, but just in that composition, you know, really fun, really fun moment. Again, shapes. So looking at these tables, obviously thought this is pretty cool. The way these are coming up here, it says here, Florence, 1933. And again, just sort of strong shadows in these shots. Um, but yeah, just playing with line and composition again, catching that boy mid-step, really important. Just a little adding to that moment, you know? I've got this thing where if I see people point in a photograph, I tend to take it. I just always have, I don't know, that's just me, but I always find it looks kind of cool. I think other photographers do that too. Um, here we go, wow, well they would pair these together, right? But the thing is, yeah, these are kind of two, they're two similar but different shots, but they're, the one on the left is that very much, you know, everyone knows this shot, it's like the spiral staircase and the cyclist is going past and he's he's just waited, right? He's set that frame up and he's waiting and the cyclist goes past and he just waits for the cyclist to clear that negative space here, bang, puts him in the photo, okay? That's kind of cool, you know? But that's like level one street photographer. I'm not gonna get into this shot behind Gare Saint Lazare and why it's so freaking amazing. I will save that for another video. But this isn't a whole different ball game. I mean, yeah, how can I put this nicely? That photograph, if you really start to think about it, it's gonna mess you up, <laughs> okay? If you're a street photographer and you get into that photograph, like really get into it, it is gonna blow your mind. But that is another video. There we go. But anyway, we're thinking about surrealism here. So and again, okay, so go back, okay. So on a surrealist level, yes, it's good. Caught the guy jumping, you feel, think of that famous photograph of Dali jumping in the air, the cat's jumping in the air. Yeah, it's nice, photography has the power to free something in the air, but there's something else going on in that photo that is just, anyway, another time, another time. So yeah, more kind of just classic kind of playing of lines, sort of very strong lines here, strong shadows, just putting things in. And some of these are kind of hard to read. They're not easy to read images, they're kind of images you're gonna to have to invest in. And I think, you know, a lot of amateur photographers like these very simplistic photographs where, you know, you look at it and you get it in a second and they like that. Whereas I think when you really start to get into photography, you wanna look at photographs you can examine, you know, you can really get into. And I think, yeah, that's where he's kind of building up to at this point. Not so surreal here. Okay, right, this shot, this shot. I've always found this shot incredibly, incredibly surreal and haunting and weird. And uh, it's the way the kid's against the wall, he's throwing his eyes back and, you know, you can see his eyes have rolled into the back of his head. And yeah, it really inspired me. And I don't know if I'd seen this photograph before I took a photo in 2001 of a kid stood in a known garden having a similar kind of, whoa, sun in the eyes epiphany, but I did. So there's a really cool thing as a photography, you know, you'd be going through photography books and there's just life, right? And we're all living life, and we're all photographers photographing life. And you might be quite surprised when you go through other photographers' work that you'll see you have photographs intentionally or maybe unintentionally look a bit like theirs. And that's really cool. And I'm not talking like, yeah, I photographed the sunset. I mean like real weird shit. Like, yeah, I photographed a kid whose eyes rolled back of the head and looked like he was blinded and having an epiphany. Like, that's not like the usual. <laughs> subject choice for most photographers but Bresson had a shot like that and I had a shot like that you know and that's kind of fun so I think yeah you'll, you'll see things like that but it's just this photo in particular is not your usual Bresson right the usual Bresson photo is kind of lots going on kind of sometimes telling a story in a photograph whereas this is so like what is going on it, it gives you hardly anything the scratched out wall the black what the kids wearing there's really there's really not much going on it kind of leaves the viewer a lot of space to kind of imagine I think that's kind of cool Right, again, these little double shots here, not so surreal for me. It's kind of, it's surreal in that this one on the right in particular, this sort of going into the infinite, it's like bizarre, man. It's like, I don't know, am I gonna sound like a crazy person maybe? But like, 
it's almost like different stages of existence. Like here's one stage and he smashed that wall and then there's another stage and another and another and another. And there's all these kind of people existing in their own kind of levels of existence. And it's, yeah, I mean, that does sound absolutely nuts, right? But hey, it's the power of photography, right? Whatever his intention was at the time of photographing it, everyone can have a different read or a different understanding or a different thought. Like just, yeah, get into it, have some fun. Uh, again, kind of wacky this one, and it's just a nice, it's more getting into kind of classic breast on less surreal, but all the windows and lining up everyone just perfectly. And you know, everything just fits in, you know, all these could be little photos. That's a photo in itself, that's a photo, and look at the leg, did it again. Uh, not so surreal, not so much, ah, yes, here we go. So, you know, these weird sort of disembodied horses here, the blown up wall in the background, the sort of figures in the background there. I mean, the horses, they're not coupled to the uh, merry-go-round anymore. And look at this one. This is like an allegory for Bresson, you know? He has he stood here, and here are these sort of targets in the background. And there's this amazing quote about um, Bresson talking about the Zen archer becoming the target before you can hit it, and he became the target. Um, yeah, very sort of nice, delicate portraits here. Just really, really compassionate, really delicate. Um, mother and daughter and father and son and just yeah really really lovely just looking at the sort of the way they've been composed and um, the father looking down the son looking down the sort of introspection and deep thought mirroring again now mirroring of body language uh, this wacky one here you know just pile of coffins that's pretty weird and then you know what's weirder still is like looking at that guy like he did he make the coffins he looks pretty pleased with his work you know um yeah wild um, next shot is a very well-known shot of his, and one thing that gets overlooked is kind of the mirroring of the circle of the signage and the sort of circle of the glasses, and the fact that glass has caught like a highlight, and looks like a sphere as well. Yeah, again, playing with depth a lot. One on the left, not so much. Um, yeah, one on the right, pretty wacky. Woman just kind of leaning through a hole in the door, and again, the way she's made up and the way she looks at that period, again, kind of fits into kind of that you know, sort of Frida Kahlo S vibe, and... Not so much the one left, but one on the right, yeah, again, weird sort of mirroring, kind of obviously having the, the the mural on the background and sort of woman's strange pose of the hand, and then the fact that there's like a sticker stuck over the eyes of the woman in the background. Yeah. Again, sort of mirroring. Not so much here, again, a bit too posed, which is surprising for Bresson, you know? He didn't really do much kind of posing. This feels very performative. And then, yeah, here we go. Kind of more surreal. Obviously, he's painting nudes previously. So you got this shot on the left where, again, quite performative, but really just really strange poses and sort of quite constructed. And yet the one on the right so much more naturalistic. And then this one, you know, again, sort of straight out of some kind of surrealist painting, very elaborate pose. And yeah, oops, I kind of, yeah, anyway, I've covered that up now. We're okay. We're okay. <laughs> um, cutting towards the end of the book. This one, yeah, some nice repetition here. But then this one, this one much more surreal. Like, what's going on? Is that a jacket from a funeral? Is this around a funeral? Is that why she's wearing black? You know, very mysterious. And lastly, two quite surreal images to finish. We've got this strange kind of lattice with the faces poking, poking through and what are these bottles and some, is it a hung up piece of meat? And then this guy just, you know, it's like a photo in a photo, isn't it? Again, just bizarre pose, again, a bit performative in the shoes. And that is that. So yeah, that's it. Um... And, you know, it makes complete sense why he would bring that kind of surrealist eye, given his background in painting, his hanging out with the surrealist. But you know what, man? Like, I didn't hang out with surrealists. Like, I didn't have any of that stuff. And I knew, even when I started photography and it started to kind of be interesting, I knew it was inherently surreal. Because the nature of photography itself is really surreal. Like, we just forget we have the power to freeze a moment of time and space. Like, that's pretty surreal. Like, we've just gotten used to it because it's been happening for so long. Um, when Bresson started out, he called himself the Surrealist Photographer. And he had some very good advice from uh, Robert Kappa. And it's funny it came from Robert Kappa because, you know, Robert Kappa's real name wasn't Robert Kappa. He was a Hungarian Jew. His real name was Andre Friedman. And to make a bit more money and to be taken more seriously, he made up this fictional American photojournalist, Robert Kappa. So Kappa said to him, look, you know, don't call yourself the Surrealist Photographer. They'll pigeonhole you. And that you'll be stuck with that label. You don't want that label. Call yourself a photojournalist. That's exactly what Bresson did, okay? So, but yeah, in this early work, you really see that, you know, him, Cartier-Bresson, the surrealist photographer. And that's really cool. And what isn't so cool is like, eventually, obviously, things come in in fashion and out of fashion. And I guess in the world of photography, Cartier-Bresson, 
It's not very fashionable, right? But the thing is, and as it said at the essay in the start of that book, like photographers for a long time have kind of got what Cartier-Bresson was going on about, and that's because it's in the work and it's in his writings, okay? And there's some photographers right now, um, especially in the UK, just looking at some street photographers like Josh Edgoose and Tom Collins, like both of their work, you can see it there. They're also surrealist street photographers, okay? That's exactly the kind of thing that kind of Bresson would have been like, yeah, here we go. They're, they're putting elements together, they're making kind of funny moments, these, these sort of snatched caught happy accident moments, but also these structured moments where you can see definitely as photographers, they're playing with you as a viewer, putting interesting elements together to make, you know, make it more interesting, humorous or surreal. So yeah, you know, still massively influential, um, purely because of the sheer quantity of like um, street photography I'm seeing, that's actually quite surreal. But, like Bresson was there, Bresson was there nearly like a hundred years ago, doing just that. So again, if you're a street photographer, um, if you've obviously kind of know Bresson through his later work, his kind of bigger studies of sort of cultures or places or whatever, check out some of his earlier work, okay? Um, there's lots of fun stuff going on, and I think if you were learning as well at the same time, you can see some of the kind of lessons that he's working through. Because after all, I think there's that famous quote, let me just, I'm gonna check my book quickly before I forget. Is it, um, let me have a look, it's one of the chapter titles in this book. There we go, that's it. The Camera as Sketchbook. Okay, the camera sketchbook. And I think if you look at um, the early work of Bresson, you'll see he's literally, it's like an artist sketchbook to him. He's trying to use the camera to work out ideas and work through ideas and sort of play with compositions to make elements surreal, playing with moments to make compositions surreal. So if you're really truly interested in street photography, you know what, your next step, try and be a bit like Bresson, try and be a surrealist street photographer. There you go, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you did, please subscribe. And yeah, I'll be doing a little bit more about Bresson later on, but it'll be kind of some of his later work. But for now, I thought that was a great way to start, because why not start at the beginning?